We are very excited about today's show. And before we begin, we got Jesse Ledoux with our product feature of the week. Jesse, tell us what you got for us. Hey, Stephen, if there's one thing that literally every pageant contestant, male, fem female, young, old, has in their arsenal, it's hairspray. But it's very important to note that all hairspray is absolutely not created equal. Do you have a fun, like, crazy hairspray experience story of, like, where your hairspray just went wrong? You don't have to, but I'm just curious. I, I can't. I have a funny story about butt, spray on butt glue, but not quite hairspray. Right, Basically, we'll a friend, another contestant had Elmer's spray on glue, and I decided to use that for my swimsuit instead. And then I had to sit on my, my high knee for four hours as I drove home from the pageant. And then I lit literally had my underwear stuck to my butt. <laughs> <laughs> so not quite hairspray, but still a very funny spray story. Anyway, okay, so let's talk about hairspray, though, because this is important. Okay. Very important. All right. So a lot Give of us a lowdown. Yes. So most hairsprays, sticky, flaky, crunchy. It's super painful to brush out. Smells awful. And even though I always say the judges can't smell you, it is important that your hairspray is serving you, which sounds ridiculous, but it's so true. So we found a hairspray that we absolutely love. It's called 1X50, and it's totally breaking the mold of hairspray. Okay. Tell us like what's different about this hairspray than maybe something else that you can just find at your local convenience store. Yeah. So there's actually a lot of hairsprays on the market have a glue or glue-like ingredient in it, which is horrible for your hair. Horrible. So what 1X50 does, it's got great holds and amazing smell. So you don't sacrifice the hairspray necessity of holding your hair. It doesn't flake. It easy, it's easy to brush out with conditioner, so you're not going to pull and damage your hair follicles. Um, it's per, it's thermal protectant, so if you use it and then you're doing, because I always put hairspray on before I style because it holds better. It's got a thermal protectant, so you don't have to worry about frying your hair, and it's packed with vitamins and nutrients. So while you have it, it's actually conditioning your hair beyond just doing its job. Oh, I didn't know that that a lot of hairsprays had glue in it. Yeah, but it, it does make sense ones because it's they're not high tech ingredients, right. so they're just using what works. Like that's like when you look, I don't know if I can't say this about Aquanet, but I would imagine like a lot of those hairsprays that like a lot of um, pageant moms out there use um, has a lot of like glue like properties. So even if it's not glue, it's something like an adhesive, which is horrible for your hair, especially if you're already back combing and teasing and doing all this heat. Um, the glue is like the last thing you need to add. Yeah. And there's something with me like, and this is just me, Stephen. I'm not saying that it has to be the listeners. But if I know I'm using a quality ingredient, be it like cologne, body wash, or even if I'm wearing a quality shirt that's not showing any brand labels, I just feel better about myself like in the process. Yeah. And so I would imagine it would be the same thing with like hair products too. Yeah, for sure. And I just like they were voted the best hairspray um, and they're just like they're doing it better. And the uh, the quality ingredients, they don't cut corners. I mean, it just makes a huge difference, especially for pageant contestants who you're doing your hair all the time. This is not just like a one-time use for one person going to the prom and they don't do anything else that's exciting or I shouldn't say exciting, anything else pageant related like we do appearances. Um, so it's just something that like for the longevity of your hair and I see it now, like my hair is damaged from not always taking care of it when I was competing, but I have to use like ultimate quality ingredients now, which is why like I love this hairspray. Got it. Okay. So where can they find it and how much is it? So you can find it at shop.pageantplanet.com. It is an all-in-one styling and finishing spray. So you use it in the process and when you're done. It's $22, but it is a huge can. And of course, free shipping from our site. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. Welcome to Pageant Planet's podcast, where we share stories and strategies to help expand and connect the global pageant community. Visit pageantplanet.com to find pageants, hire coaches, shop for dresses, and more. Now, here's your host, Stephen Roddy. Welcome to another episode. Today, Jesse and myself, we are going to be discussing the life of Julia Morley, who is the director of Miss World. So Jesse, set the stage for us. Stephen, at Pageant Planet, we know that starting and running an organization of any kind, but specifically a pageant, is difficult. And there is constant planning, traveling, connecting, spending moolah. However, like this is a labor of love for directors. People that go into this, this realm of the industry like they love it and they love their contestants. They start for a number of reasons, but mostly to give back. And nobody knows this better than Julia Morley, who's the chairwoman of the Miss World organization. Uh, she's a British, British businesswoman, charity worker, former model, 
And as we know, um, she runs Miss World and the annual Miss Mr. World competition that happens every other year. So, Stephen, what do you think makes a great director? Yeah, the, the challenging thing about being a director is that you have to wear so many hats. You have to be a marketer, mm-hmm. you have to be a recruiter, a financier, and a lot of times, and then a really good accountant and like... Uh, and also a PR specialist. If your contestants do something wild, you have to be a counselor if somebody's going through something traumatic. And so it is a really versatile position as far as skill set. But I, I think one of the things that set really great directors from just average ones is organization and like communication skills. Mm-hmm. If you just have those two skill sets, right? If you're organized, you, you're able to say, okay, who has their paperwork in, who has their resumes in, and you're able to organize a good event that's like logic and not like a lot, not a bunch of holdups, and you can communicate changes and communicate agenda to your contestants, those two skill sets, I feel, are the most important. Yeah. And I also think in addition to those, you have to actually want your contestants to succeed. So I've seen a lot of directors lately who are trying to set themselves apart from the pack. There are so many pageants, so many different competitions that contestants can really go anywhere they want. So how as a director are you setting yourself apart? So I'm seeing a lot of directors recently create personal development seminars leading into their pageant or kind of giving contestants the tools that they would give their title holder after they win before the competition, which is a huge advantage for anyone competing because it kind of lessens the learning curve, if you will. So directors who go the extra mile always stand out from the crowd for me. Yeah, and as a director, as long as you host the event and you get girls to come, like women are amazing at just organically building a community. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you and all the other people on staff have built the community of pageant planet inside of our organization. Like I I take zero credit for that. Um, And that's very similar to that of a director. And then I feel like once that community starts to grow, it just takes on a life of its own because people are like uh, women specifically reach out to their friends and say, come compete. It's the best time ever. Let's go on vacation to fill in the blank of the country of the state where it's located. Um, So that's a, a really powerful tool also. Well, I think this is why we're talking about Julia is that her directorship kind of came organically, but she has made so many personal steps to make it her own. So why don't you kind of give us some background of her? Yeah. So Julia, well, she was born Julia Evelyn Pritchard on October the 2nd, 1939 in London. And she was working as a model when she met her husband, Eric Morley. And at the time, he was the director of Mecca Dancing um, at a dance hall located in Leeds, England. Not a lot of stuff going on in Leeds, if I remember correctly. Mm. Um, but the the two married in 1960 when Julia was only 21 years old. Is it possible there was lots going on in 1960? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never been to England, so I have no bearing of where it is. Can you give us like a reference point? I don't know. My geography is horrible, but I remember um, there was there was a pageant that was wanting me to come there in Leeds, and I thought it was in Leeds. But now I'm like now that I'm being put on the spot, I'm like second guessing myself. But I oh, remember no. like what's there to do in Leeds, and I remember googling it. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll extend the trip. And there just wasn't a whole lot, and like you almost had to fly into London and then take a train mm. ride up or over or somewhere, but I don't feel like if you flew into Leeds, it was such a small airport, it just increased the cost um, exponentially for the director. So that's why they were like going to fly me into London and then take me a train up. But anyway, so that was, a, it, it never really, it never really panned out for this particular pageant, but I do remember uh, <laughs> researching Leeds and I was like, what's there to do? And it was like not much. And it was like an hour or two away from anything that there was something to do. So that was my memory of Leeds. Got it. Okay. Clear enough. Okay. Um, but before they even got married, Eric had laid the groundwork for the Miss World pageant all the way back in 1951. So they got married in 1960. Like this was already well on its way. Yeah. And after a decade of war, um, Eric Morley, Julia's husband, was tasked with creating a PR exercise for Mecca, who owned everything from like cinemas to ice skating at the time. Big organization. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. And in 1951, like we said, the first Miss World pageant, which was actually then called Miss World Festival Bikini Girl, which probably a very long sash, was introduced as part of the Festival of Britain celebrations to boost national pride and garner overseas attention. So at the time, 26 of the, quote, world's most beautiful women gathered together in one place. And the event was very popular with the press and was dubbed, quote, Miss World by the media, kind of shortening that very long title. And according to an interview with The Telegraph, Morley said of the moment, Miss World was born. Mm. The swimsuit competition was intended as a promotion for the bikini, which really had only recently been introduced into the market. The bikini was still widely regarded as Mm. immodest. It kind of sounds like very similar beginnings to Miss America. It really does. And when the Miss World pageant winner, the first one in 1951, Kirsten Kiki Hankison from Sweden was crowned in a bikini, it added to the controversy. Yeah, she was the only winner for Miss World ever to be crowned in a bikini. Wow. So the Miss World Festival Bikini Girl was originally mm-hmm. only planned for the Festival of Britain. However, after the press coverage, Eric Morley, and smartly so, decided to make Miss World pageant an annual event. So Julia registered the Miss World name as a trademark, and all future pageants were held under that name. However, because of the controversy arising from Kiki, uh, crowning in the bikini, kind of Kiki hmm. bikini, uh, countries and with religious traditions threatened not to send delegates to future events. In addition, the bikini was condemned by the Pope himself. Ouch. Yeah, so Stephen, you have a Bible study background. How do you feel about swimsuit competition and pageants? I know we've talked about like it demonstrates the hard work, but from that religious angle of, of your life, what does it say for you? So I had a pastor tell me once because um, no one, I well, actually very few people I went to Bible college with know this about me, but I paid my way through Bible college while working as a model. So like literally I would be in church from like, Monday to Friday, well, like Sunday to Friday, and then Friday I would fly out and go to like modeling gigs in like South Beach, where it's like shirt off and you're surrounded by people doing very non-religious activities. And so I had a, a, a preacher tell me, he was like, well, you didn't see Jesus like preaching with his shirt off. Because my thing was like, you know, these people like need Jesus, right? <laughs> I'm around mm-hmm. a bunch of people that like, Jesus would enhance their lives. And he was like, well, you didn't see Jesus preaching with his shirt off. And my response to that was like, well, it was a different time and place. And I think culturally and historically, we've all really evolved where we live and we go to things like the beach for vacation. So, Mm -hmm. you know, having a swimsuit, you know, something to swim in, you're naturally not going to swim in sweatpants and a sweatshirt. One, that's like hazardous because <laughs> it's hard to swim in those things. And two, like originally God designed us with no clothes. Like if you look at our skin, our skin is the best type of fabric on the planet. I mean, it dries, it doesn't it wear out, it stretches when you grow, like all that kind of stuff. I mean, God just mm-hmm. created us with skin. He didn't create us with like fig leaves. And I mean, it wasn't after until like sin entered the world into the Bible that God like actually made (laughs) Adam and Eve like a little fig leaf and all that. But it was because of like what was going on inside of them that he Mm. did that for them because they were embarrassed of their nakedness. God's like, this is beautiful. I made you like this. Like why Mm -hmm. is this a big deal? So um, I kind of went down a bunny trail there. But so in short, like I have zero issues with it. But like anything new, it is controversy when you come out and all of a sudden, like people are scantily dressed. And to give you a fun fact, historically, um, you know the Silk Road and and all that. Like when silks were first introduced to the Roman Empire from China, it was very scandalous because it was like mm. girls might as well not be wearing anything. And then the women loved it because it was like it cost more than gold during certain periods. Right. Um, and it was traded as currency because it was so valuable. But when women wore it, 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 bre- it was very airy. It was very fashion forward. But it was like, oh, they might as well not be Status. wearing anything yeah. because you can kind of see through it too. You know, so it was very scandalous even back then. So, you know, naturally, so the bikini was new and people's organic rejection, especially from a religious background, is to reject anything that's, that's new. 
That was interesting because I, I guess I didn't think about the silk aspect being a fashion icon, like a fashion faux pas either within the, the community. But I mean, it makes sense. All of that makes sense to me. Yeah. So anyways, that's my that's my two cents. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. All right. So objection to the bikini led to its replacement in all future pageants with what was air quotes accepted as a more modest swimwear. And the Mm -hmm. pageant's popularity grew with the advent of television. Yeah, and through the advancement of technology, it's contributed to the success of Miss World and pageants alike. Even though that's happened, Julia herself is not a huge fan of technology. In an interview, she actually said of social media and technology, and Stephen, why don't you read her response about social media and technology? She said, um, I definitely have some commentary after this, but she says, it's a terrible (laughs) thing. I mean, it's good to a certain degree, but I'd rather turn my phone off for days to have a conversation. No one talks anymore. It's a library. Um, every room you go into, people are looking down, not around. I don't have WhatsApp or what's about or what's <laughs> doing who. Um, I hate it. I don't want to know. I don't care. I'd rather have someone call me and tell me they're getting married or having a baby or if they screwed up, right? Mm-hmm. And so my commentary around this, and it's like you see this within businesses, all the time and this is what causes businesses to slip is the like the thing that they do not do is evolve with technology like again historically look at it whenever there's a new wave if they don't adapt with technology they start to lose footing Mm -hmm. and for julia someone whose company was made popularized because of the media And because of technology with television, then to be kind of resisting the social media era, um, it's kind of telling, right? Yep. So I would say if you don't have a passion for technology, hire someone who does so that they can keep your organization on track, basically. Yeah. And that being said, like, I totally agree with her that so many people are just, I mean, you go around dinner, I'm like, come on, people, can we put down the phones? Like, let's chat. And, but if you look back and the day you see all these pictures of people lined up sitting in a row and they're all reading newspapers. You know, it's the, it's the same thing historically where people are distracted based on like, you know, whatever interests them or like it was newspapers and then it was magazines and then it was TV and now it's cell phones. So it's like the technology has changed, but the principle of people is the same. Right. Well, I think let's in 1959, which is when the CBC <laughs> and we're back. started. Like, well, I'm just no, I'm just saying like that was you're talking about how it's kind of the sentiment has always stayed the same, even though technology is, has evolved. So like, right. when BBC started broadcasting the pageant, it was 1959. So like, cell phones weren't a thing. Like, it wasn't a thing. And then like, as we continued to move on during the 60s, the 70s, Miss World became one of the most watched programs of the year in British television. And this sat blew me away, Stephen. At its peak, the Miss World show claimed an audience of 27 and a half million viewers in Britain alone. And this is really what's going to blow your mind. That figure is comparable to that of a royal wedding. Wow. Well, but it it makes sense, though, because so... Mm -hmm. During that time, there was zero reality television shows. Like pageantry was reality television. So there was zero competition. And then, of course, like the Royal Wedding. But then also, there wasn't any other um, like technology. So people right now, they'll say, oh, pageantry is not relevant because viewership for Miss America is down or viewership for Miss World is down. It's like, duh, viewership for the Super Bowl is down. Viewership for like the, the World Soccer, the World Cup is down like it's all down because people are no longer watching television like they once did it's competing with netflix it's competing with hulu and what else is we ever got choices else? now right amazon prime and just like your cell phone and social media right so yeah everything is down because that platform is changing you can't use mm-hmm. television as a barometer for what's popular because television itself is becoming antiquated like the newspaper right yeah okay i'm ready to cancel back. <laughs> oh yeah we don't Renata and I we have cable basic cable but it's like our cable box is like in our closet we don't even use it and the reason why we got it is because the cable company was like oh if you do this you can get a higher the speed bundle, internet maybe. right you yeah. can get a higher speed internet for and it was like less expensive so I'm like okay whatever give it to me but mm-hmm. they're doing that to offset their costs too right right 
Anyway, so beauty back to uh, we're transitioning now to beauty with a purpose. And uh, Eric Morley, um, he had been the chair of the Miss World organization, and Julia remained behind the scenes, chaperoning contestants and just handling the press. Then her us- husband asked her to become more involved in the pageant. And she said at the time, I was a mother and a housewife in an unfamiliar business world. I think that's pretty awesome of him to say, you should be more involved in this um, in this pageant on the business perspective. Yeah, for sure. He was extremely supportive. And as we know, like he had already started on this path and he really wanted Julia to be his partner in it, which was great. And at that time when he asked her to be more involved, she said she wanted to have more of a purpose and teach the contestants skills they can use both on and off the stage. Cause she started as a model, right? So she did know that there was more to pageantry and she didn't think women having to go on stage in swimsuits, walking and turning was enough. So it's, she like said, like, it's not about the bikinis and the washboard stomachs. Just look at the bios of some of the competitors as early as 1966, India's first Miss World qualified as a doctor. And every year there have been, there have been engineers, opera singers, as well as models and Hollywood actresses. So you kind of see a scope of different backgrounds and ambitions. Yeah. And in 1972, she found a beauty with a purpose portion of the competition. The project had empowered contestants to use their abilities to make real and lasting contributions to the lives of the sick and disadvantaged. And Morley's vision for Beauty with a Purpose was inspired by the profound encounter in Singapore. She first visited the city-state in 1971 and was intrigued by an old lady she would observe each morning from her hotel room window. And Morley recalls in an interview with Prestige, Jesse, you want to read that for us? Yeah, so she said the old lady would walk out on the streets with two bags in her hands. One had clean towels, the other was filled with food, in which she would pass to the people on the streets. This was 1971, and people were still quite poor in Singapore, but I watched her going around, putting her hand on people's shoulders, helping them cope daily. Wow. She talked to the participating countries about how they might work alongside the contest to leave a lasting effect on local charitable causes. Eight countries participated in its inaugural year, and now every Miss World contestant is involved. It awards a contestant with the most relevant and important charity project in her nation. Yeah. And since 2003, actually, Stephen, the winner automatically makes the quarterfinal. So like, really pushes you to really try in this phase of competition in ways that a lot of other pageants don't. Wow. And Miss World 2017, that's 14 years for those of you counting at home. Um, Minoshi and uh, Minoshi Kalar from India is the first and only Beauty with a Purpose recipient to eventually win the Miss World crown, which is interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And this is a huge coaching moment. So that's 14 years since the winner automatically makes quarterfinals beauty with a purpose, but only one has won. So hear me out with this coaching moment. Don't rely on platform for platform based pageants. And the reason I say this is most pageants who incorporate platform even heavily, don't consider it as part of the main scoring or as a large or as the largest percentage. Remember there are usually other phases that will need to carry through your scores. So I'd say like, don't underestimate spending equitable time on categories. Like you need to look the part as much as you act the part, depending upon the scoring. So if you show up to, um, Miss International, let's say, because that's the pageant I know the best and it's 40% interview. So a huge portion of that is how you communicate your community service involvement 20% fun fashion, 20% evening gown, 20% fitness. If you spend all your time on your platform, you don't spend any time in the gym getting toned. You don't really think about your best best option for evening gown or fun fashion. You're not going to win. So I've heard a number of times over and over again, contestants who compete for pageant-based pageants, platform-based pageants, (laughs) and they say, I I had the best platform there. I said, okay, but your other scores were probably below everybody like they're probably the bottom 25 percent so you really can't rely on your platform to carry you through and like i said miss world so heavily involved in beauty with a purpose they think it's so important which they do and they celebrate it that's not all that's important so don't put all your eggs in one basket yeah and to you know maybe hit it from a slightly different perspective if i'm a judge scoring you an evening gown i'm not going to say wow she deserves a six but you know what she had such a great platform. Let's give her an eight. <laughs> you know, well, I, not- do, I do think there is a bit of a judge halo effect. If they remember you, that's the first key. They have to remember you from interview. So and I believe, lo- oh, go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, you. And so I, I believe that there's a judge halo effect on interview if I connect with you. Right. Right. But and I believe that there's a halo effect in platform for the people that you're helping. But if mm-hmm. the judges aren't able to connect like how you helped and inside of the interview and like, wow, she really did all these things and she's kind of have a heart of gold, then I don't feel like that halo effect just transitions because you raised a lot of money for charity. It's like, wow, right. she's just good at raising money. But yes. she's yeah. So that's kind of the saying. point I was making. Yeah, I totally get it. Um but it's one of those things like you have to carry that over. Like it has to be a strong enough connection to yeah. make it to the stage. But I do think it is a thing. Um, but that said, just look at the scoring of your pageant. And if, if you're competing because you are passionate about a cause, fantastic. Dedicate most of your time there. But just don't ignore the rest of it because the scores are the scores at the end of the day. Yeah. And something like what you said with uh, Miss World, I think at like 100 and well, well over 100 uh, contestants i won't get into yeah. specifics but because you like automatically make the finals right some of the judges and i mean miss world's a month long right and the judges are like in the trenches with the contestants mm-hmm. so yeah. they kind of like live side by side um so but even still like if you make it to the finals it's just another way for them to to maybe see you from a different light and to help you stand out yeah. um from the crowd. So yes. it's not going to hurt your cause by any stretch of the imagination. Right. But you can't go on stage in a potato sack and win with a great platform most right. of the time. Yeah. And I think that's the point that we're both making. Yep. Okay. So today it's estimated that Beauty with a Purpose in this status crazy has raised over 3 million euros for charitable causes. Mm. And through the global impact, Morley's Beauty with a Purpose is an unprecedented achievement. Um, and there is one project that remains very close to her heart. Yeah. She describes Miss Indonesia World 2014, Maria Rahajang, I think I'm saying that correctly, Beauty with a Purpose Project as a benchmark for what can be achieved. And the project is dubbed the Golden Bridge. And she took it upon herself to rebuild a dilapidated bridge used by students to get to school after she noticed a young boy with serious injuries sustained from falling from that broken bridge. Yeah. Maria helped to raise the funds and even convince villagers to come together for the construction of the Golden Pathway to better education and opportunity, which links two villages in Baton, uh, which is located near, is it Jak- Jakarta? Yes, Jakarta. Jakarta. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and even two years later, Stephanie Delvell, Miss World 2016, she said of the, that specific project, it's so beautiful. Everyone on the show talks about it because Miss World is a show. I even have pictures of the bridge on my phone. And I, I'm guessing she was kind of using it as like a vision board or a, a reference to really what can be achieved as Miss mm. World. Yeah. Julie is happy that the pageant is able to cultivate a sense of purpose for the women. And this is what she said to Prestige. You want to read that for us? Yeah. The projects these ladies have embarked on have given them a new impression on life and the future. Now they're not looking inwards, they're looking outwards. And in fact, Julia believes beauty with a purpose is what sets the Miss World organization apart. Um, And she said of Miss World um, and beauty with a purpose, this, Stephen. Uh, She said, the true beauty of Miss World is beauty with a purpose. The work we do is so precious. Uh, Recent projects has... Um, including raising over 500,000 euros in Wales in the last year in the support of children with terminal illnesses. In Devon, we've provided a home where parents of seriously ill children can go for respite. And in the Philippines, we've arranged for a wonderful little girl called Sunshine Mm -hmm. to have a life-saving heart surgery. It's amazing. It is amazing. And she's continued to grow the Miss World organization and Beauty with a Purpose. And 15 years after the first Miss World pageant, there were 86 countries participating. And Huge. So, yeah. And so with this, a, a nice little story. Um, so there was a, and I won't say her, her name, but th- there was a contestant that I knew, spoke to, um, was that doing the same pageants together and all that her director was not living up to kind of the standards of what Julia has for her national director. Mm -hmm. And so she, you do a lot of appearances, a lot of travel and all that. And Julia realized that this director was not giving her any money. And Julia was like, wait, what? Like this person is not paying you for anything. Like, how are you surviving? She's like, well, you know, thankfully my parents helped me out a lot and all that. She's like, Oh my gosh. And just like, 
gave her like a f- like several thousand dollars <gasps> just right there. Just like, oh my, I am so sorry. Like, here's money. Like, just just gave it to her. Just like, I am so sorry. I'm going to have a talk with this person. And wow. now that person is no longer directing for that organization. <laughs> so talk she did indeed. So it really shows the compassion that she has not even for those people outside, but also for the people inside, which I think is tremendous. So I'm having a revelation at the moment. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of annoyed at myself as a human because I was so one track mind when I was competing, when my teens and early twenties about Miss Miss Teen USA when I was a teen and then Miss America after that. And I never even considered other major national pageants and ultimately international pageants until I aged out of Miss America. And then I won Miss International. I was very happy to retire at that point. Like I had reached a title that I really had hoped I would receive at some point. And I'm mad that I didn't consider other systems. So if you're listening, this is like an unofficial coaching moment. Like open your eyes to other systems because there's so much more out there and there's so much more that's so widely respected and people that will, that are trying to make a difference. If that's your goal and that's why you're competing, like there's, there's more to life than the traditional I'll say. Yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. So let's talk about like the the eighties. So we're kind of going in chronological order here and Julia helped revamp the competition to include additional competitions to continue to highlight that intelligence and personality that she was going for with beauty with purpose. And she included a talent category. And while more and more countries continue to participate, there was a slight downturn in terms of television ratings. Um, so she made a really hard decision, Stephen. What was that decision she made? She said, I believe the decision to take it off um, terrestrial TV was made by people who wanted to change for change's sake. It made me realize that although I'm incredibly patriotic and I love Britain, it is not the end of the world if Britain's decision makers chose not to show it. Like after mm-hmm. all, we are televised in over 186 countries and have a massive internet following with millions of more viewers. Which is kind of interesting that she points to the internet when she's hating on social media. So like when she just doesn't want social media. Again, it's, you just have to keep it separate. It's like business and personal. Like her personal opinion is she hates it. Professional opinion is you need it. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Right? Yep. So I have, an, I have another little coaching moment and I'm dying to hear what you think about this. Okay. Um, in my opinion, you can never be famous in your hometown. So like, do you ever notice when you start something new and you can look for support in your hometown backwards and forwards and really never find it? Like people are like, oh yeah, like just, especially if you live in a smaller town where you've known the same people your entire lives. However, when you venture out, people are interested. They're hearing it for the first time or they're meeting you for the first time. They're instantly like more intrigued than people that you see on a regular basis. They're kind of blind to your success and your growth sometimes, I think. So Stephen, like for example, let's put it you in perspective. How did Belle Prey, Ohio receive you when you were starting Pageant Planet versus when you would go to like host an event in Atlanta? Mm. Well, okay. So one, like Jesus even said that uh, in the Bible. Yeah, so, so we were talking about that earlier. You can't be famous in your hometown? Jesus yeah. said that? Yeah. He used it in different terms. He said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. Interesting. Because the, the fewest amount of miracles Jesus was able to do was in his hometown. Everywhere else, he was like making paraplegics walk and healing leprosy. And in the Bible, it said like he did no big miracles outside of like laying hands on a few sick in his own hometown. Wow. So it's even applicable to Jesus like at the time. And so, yeah, it's true. I didn't necessarily – most people in Belpre didn't know what I was working on, you know, because it was in the internet. But with my family, my family would poke fun at me, right? Um, mm-hmm. my mom and dad still have never been to a pageant, you know, the closest thing to a pageant was when they flew in for the 10 year anniversary and met, um, you know, all you all, the staff. And that was the first time they really even met anyone that worked for, for me, to my knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, so whenever you go someplace else and like to my friends, I'm just like, Steven, I'm like, oh yeah, you got that pageant thing. And I think it's great. And, but you know, it's like, familiarity there's another saying that familiarity breeds contempt people that know you um somewhat take you for granted you know it's kind of why we cap off when we're having a bad day on the people that are closest to us Mm -hmm. the the people that we love the most you know so when renata and i are having a bad day we feel that from each other more than anybody else well somebody else comes in it's like hey 
it's, it's okay, you know, <laughs> when she and I are having a bad day, it can be like at odds, right? So mm-hmm. um, it, it's applicable everywhere and it just kind of goes with the course. So, I mean, I remember in Belpery, um, you know, when I was starting Pageant Planet and this was like three or four years in, um, I was still very much like working out of coffee shops in order to try to like get it right um, mm-hmm. like, or to try to get the thing off the ground and I still couldn't afford a laptop like you know, <laughs> like three or four years in so I was bringing in my whole desktop computer into at that time a Panera Bread because we didn't have a Starbucks and just plugging in and I just remember this girl looking at me like that I had known from like high school or whatever and she was like you look ridiculous <laughs> I was like don't you Janet <laughs> I know it's like it is what it is, you know, I'm just, you know, working with what I got. So, and that was that. And so, yeah, it don't be shocked if people that are around you say that your pageant dreams are ridiculous or you're not going to make it or I don't think you have a chance because that's the story with anyone that's doing anything of significance. The people that are around you, I mean, my own mom made fun of me. <laughs> when, I, when I was doing it, you know, when I was uh, like made fun of like the little small successes that I would do. Um, and my mom and dad are very supportive. It wasn't anything like that, but she did, you know, um, mm-hmm. early on. And it just is what it is. So like you just kind of have to just grin and bear it and believe within yourself that you're doing something great and that one day they'll come around. And even if they don't, it's okay because it yeah. matters zero. It yeah. really does. Yep. Yeah. So I, I love that sentiment. And I would say like, even to build upon it, just try to expand your opportunities. And even if you just hold a local title, visit a neighboring chapter of your platform's cause, do an appearance, a town over, or call another local title holder and say, Hey, you got anything I can come join you with. I'll return the favor and just kind of see how the doors start to open in a new way. And like, When you keep getting doors shut on you in your local community, it can be really hard. So you just might need that opportunity to say like, yeah, I am in this for the right reasons and I am in the right place. Um, So just it's never a bad idea to go outside your initial circle to try something new. Yep. So ITV's Thames Television took over the UK broadcasting rights between 1980 and 1988. And during the early 1990s, my golden age, really, there was a decline in the popularity of mainstream television broadcasts of the event after it became, quote unquote, increasingly unfashionable in the late 1980s. uh, The pageant returned on satellite channel Sky One, sounds very fancy, in 1997 before moving to Channel 5 for three years, uh, 1998 through 2000. And it was several years of tumultuous changes in the Miss World organization. Then on November 9th, 2000, the year I graduated high school, Mm -hmm. the the day after the contestants first uh, paraded at the Millennium Dome in preparation for the 2000 Miss World finals, Eric Morley had a heart attack and died in the Princess Grace Hospital of West London. So a service of Thanksgiving was held in the Guards Chapel, Wellington Barracks, with the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Edinburgh being represented. That's huge. It is so sad that he died like during during the pageant. It's crazy. It is. It says so much though about who attended. Because you think about the numbers we talked about, like the five hundred was it 500 million euros that have been raised through the Miss World organization? I mean, clearly they were well-regarded and I mean, you don't have an organization for for, what started 1951 for 50 years, 40 years without gaining respect along the way. It just says so much about them. Yeah. Between the viewership and I mean, to be exact, it was 300 million euros, but Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. What's a few hundred between friends? I mean, still 300 million euros, like no joke, right? Like nothing to seize at, but I mean, so like we said, like Julia was always a partner in this and it was just five months after his death that she stepped into the role as chairwoman of the Miss World pageant 
However, the decision was not easy. And she told Express UK in an interview, it was very difficult after Eric died because I had a vision for the Miss World organization, but no experience in business. I'd never written a business plan or managed money before. There were things that Eric had always looked after. I had to borrow 5 million euros in order to alter the direction of the business. I wanted to take it to tourism because I could see how that would increase turnover, turnover being a good thing in this instance, um, and help raise the Miss World profile. Yeah, Julia continued with her vision, which is so smart to target tourism. And now besides girls and bikinis, pageant also has three interviews, a talent competition, sports competition, beauty with a purpose, and a dances of the world segment. Morley truly wanted contestants to be known for more than how they look in a swimsuit. And she mm-hmm. said, quote, I think bikinis are wonderful when worn on the beach, but not on stage while someone is trying to interview with you. I believe I've changed the event into a truly international showcase of beauty, fashion, talent, and culture, which brings nations together in a way that is unmatched by any other event, not even the Olympics. It's a bold that statement. That is bold. Bold. Yeah. Bold. Yeah. Get it, Julia. So she, bold, super bold. Be bold. Inspired yeah. by Julia Morley. Uh-huh. Um, She also introduced the concept of fast track competitions starting in the early 2000s, and the winners of these preliminary competitions would automatically receive a spot in the semifinals. So um, Miss World Beach Beauty, which replaced Best in Swimsuit, Beauty with a Purpose, Miss World Sports, Miss World Talent, Miss World's Top Model were guaranteed a spot in the semifinals starting in 2003, and then they added uh, Miss World Multimedia in 2012. Yeah. So while Miss World has grown to become so much more than a pageant, one may wonder if there is another factor, another mm-hmm. other than the revamped format to credit the organization's success. Julia not only had a huge vision for the organization when she took the role of CEO, she also understood how the pageant, not just the individual contestants, can give back to communities. Yep, she's totally in the business of tourism, and the Miss World organization has a staggering effect on local communities. And let's rattle off some examples because they're impressive. So South Africa's Sun City saw overseas visitor visitor numbers tremble during the four years that Miss World was broadcast from there, from 1992 to 1996. In 2000, when Miss World was held in the Maldives, low season bookings soared by 30% as a direct result. Mm, wow. So it, it tripled in South Africa and then 30% there. And then in 2006, um, host nation Poland benefited in, to the tune of 41 million euros and the creation of more than 20,000 jobs during 2006. That's crazy. Oh. I read ahead. That was the early gasp because I was like blown away. By <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, 20,000 jobs? What? That's, I mean, imagine, yeah, huge. Huge. Okay, so the last one we'll read off is in 2010, after a resort of Sanya in China hosted the finals, the international tourist figures rose by 42% and international trade by 70%. And the city's mayor described this as the Miss World effect. Very simple. Again, these are fun stats to share with people when they say pageantry is no longer relevant. Mm-hmm. Like, so amazing. I mean, really massive impacts that normally is attributed to sporting events is being attributed yeah. to pageantry. Hey. So, hey, the Miss World organization has a huge international network and countries who participate um, license the Miss World name from the organization. However, a few years ago, Julia decided to downsize. She didn't like being part of a big organization, which didn't allow flexibility in management decisions. And now there is no board, which is something she doesn't treat with just you know, a frivol- frivolous. And she has allowed her to make quick decisions when she needs to. She has a small team where everyone piles in a modest turnover of five to six million euros per year. And she just says, I love it. She <laughs> loves a small organization. Yeah, and she. We also talk about like men's pageants on occasion too. It's really important to our industry as well. That's not, not talked about enough. And Julia is the owner of Mister World, which started in 1996 and is held by biennial, biennially, which is every other year. Um, and the last pageant was held in 2016, from with the winner from India being crowned at the end of the event. And if you're doing the math. You are scratching your head since it's 2019, so it's every two years, but we haven't had one since 2016. Mm, Got it. So the pageant was not held in 2018. However, the Mm -hmm. finals competition for the Mr. World 2019 has been scheduled to take place on August 23rd, um, which was yesterday, 2019. We got the the, results, too. Oh, yay! At the Smart, um, Smart 
Arneta Coliseum, which is located in the Philippines. And actually, a record of 80 contestants were registered to participate. And like Miss World, contestants from Mr. World compete in a variety of phases. So what are those phases? So extreme is the test of strength, endurance, and uh, rugged determination. Mm -hmm. Sport is the test of skill, discipline, and athleticism. Talent and creativity is about the contestants' finesse, technique, and their dedication. Fashion looks at the men just kind of getting it right for style's sakes. And multimedia looks at their charisma and how contestants present themselves, as well as how they engage and interact with an online audience. Love that. Yeah, and like Sports Challenge serves as a fast track. So unlike Miss World, they're not all fast tracks. Um, and the winner automatically qualifies for the semifinals in sports. And this year's winner was from South Africa. However, last night, five hours ago, literally five hours ago, before we recorded this podcast, the winner of Mr. World 2019 was England, Jack Hasselwood. And the runners up, I bet this burns him, was South Africa, who was the fast track winner for sports. Um, and Mexico, they run out the top three. And then Brazil and Dominican Republic were also in the top five. Gosh, similar countries that we, you know, it's funny, it's similar countries that we see in the top tens of like women's international competitions. Yeah, and that makes me wonder if they have the same prep teams because, I mean, that's kind of coincidental or they're just naturally more beautiful than the rest of the world. Who knows? I mean, as a man who's Maybe. married to a Brazilian woman, I would agree. Slightly more beautiful. Um, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> So today, the Miss World organization is considered one of the big four international pageants. Julia said Miss World is not just a beauty pageant. When you watch our show, you must identify it as something different. There's mm. fashion, fitness, awareness programs. It has a purpose, and our idea is to make women comfortable, which now, I guess it's men, too. Women and on February, <laughs> yes, men, too, every every other year, biennial, biennially, biennially. That's a, that's a tough word. Yeah. It's it is word. hard. There's like a weird vowel in there. Anyway, yeah. On February 19th, 2019 in Thailand, um, Julia and some special guests officially announced a mid-December date for the contest. Yeah. And on July 2nd, 2019, she was with Vanessa Ponce, the reigning Miss World, um, appeared on Good Morning Britain with Pierce Morgan, which is kind of fun. And mm -hmm. it was announced that the pageant will be held on Saturday, December 14th, 2019 at the XL London and that Miss World 2020 will be held in Thailand. And Julia said, London is the greatest city in the world to visit. And she, maybe she's a little biased. It is where <laughs> Miss World started in 1951 as part of the Festival of Britain celebrations. And this year, we are going to put on the best show ever. No pressure. No pressure. Our Miss World Festival, she continues to say, will be held in Thailand in 2020 to celebrate our 70th year. Thailand will be working very closely in London with us to share the London experience. Full details of our 2020 celebrations will be announced shortly. So far, 60 contestants are confirmed with 16 more national pageants planned to take place. Registration is still open for countries that do not have a national pageant. And for reference, last year, the pageant had 118 contestants. This year, the plan is 130. Woo. That's Holy crazy. Moly. It's awesome. And when she was asked about what her late husband, Eric, would think of the pageant today. She said Eric would have been hugely proud of what we've achieved in the past 13 years. And he was a very kind person and always ready to help any child in need. Mm, beautiful. So Morley, along with her late husband, have created one of the most successful yet charitable pageants in the world. And at 79, Morley shows no sign of slowing down. She is constantly traveling around the world with the Miss Organization. She said, my aunt lived till she was 103, so I think I have a few more years. But honestly, I'm not afraid to die. I'm only afraid not to have lived. Mm, beautiful. The founding and running an organization as large and impactful as Miss World is no easy task. And, you know, in words of Julia, she says, my dear, it is better it is not better to light one candle in the darkness than not to see at all. It, so my dear, is it not better to light one candle in the darkness than not to see at all? That's really pretty. I had to read it a second time to kind of connect with it, but mm -hmm. I like it. So my dear, it is not better. Uh, I'm sorry. It's a question. My dear, is it not better to light one candle in the darkness than to not see at all? It's really poetic and really mm -hmm. beautiful. So yeah. Thank you all for listening so much. And if you've received benefit from this 
unsponsored podcast. This is not a sponsored <laughs> podcast, or this world did not pay us, nor did Julia. Um, then please consider giving us a five star review. It really does help us keep the show going, and it also helps us like. Did you like it? I mean, it helps Jesse and I when we re- read these reviews and see the star ratings. It helps us like if we liked it. Now, if you didn't like this podcast for whatever reason, don't just give us a one star to tell us. I mean, email us that. You know, <laughs> more if you didn't like one particular episode, then you know, don't give us a one star. Email us that you didn't like it. But if as a whole, if you like it, by all means, give us a one star. Leave some comments. Give us a like on YouTube. Again, help us to keep this show going. Thank you so much. Want to become a part of pageant history? Create a free contestant or business profile on pageantplanet.com to unlock hidden features and connect with other experts throughout the world.